What do you want me to do for you? That's the question Jesus asked blind Bartimaeus. That's the question he asked Andrew and Philip in John 1, 35 to 38, when two of John the Baptist's disciples, Andrew and Philip, were seeing Jesus. And, and John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And it says in John 1, 38, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? What do you want? In John 5, there's an invalid at the pool of Bethesda. He can't get up, can't get to the pool in time. He's invalid. And Jesus comes up to him and asks him the question, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Jesus appeals to our wants and our deepest desire. Jesus is trying to get to what it is that we really desire more than anything else. And that's the question Jesus is asking you today. What do you want me to do for you? How do you respond to that question today, this morning? Now, to some of our ears, Jesus' question seems a little bizarre, barely makes sense. What do you want? Me? What do you want? That's because our desire can be mixed. Our desires have capacities to do such good in the world, but our desires can also be destructive if directed in the wrong way. And when you think of desire, you might think of more destructive things that our desires can do. I mean, look around the world, you see how destructive desires can be from nation against nation to just individuals to relationships and marriages. So you might be thrown off by this question. It may barely make sense to you. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, you know my wants. I'm a mixed bag. When it comes to wants, some are good, some are bad. And so maybe the best response that you have right now to that question is, I don't know. I don't know what I want. Or when you think of desire at its worst, your response is, why would Jesus ask such a thing? Hmm. Well, let's first get at what desire means. What, does, what is desire? Desire is born out of being made in God's image. Desire is part of being human. To be human is to want. And to want is because we are made in God's image. God wants. God desires. And in the scriptures, we see how God wills something. And when God wills something, he's saying, I want this, and I'm going to take I'm going to make it come into existence. If you think of creation, let there be light. God wanted light, and there was light. Now, for us, we may want something, but oftentimes the things that we want, we can't just speak into existence, right? For us, it's desire that's also a series of choices that happen after that desire. There's a series of decisions to make that thing come into existence, right? And so that's what desire looks like for us. But desire is a good thing. It is a good thing because it reflects the image of God. But desire, just with like with God, desire is not just what I feel. It's not just an emotion, is it? Desire is something that involves our emotion, but it involves our will involves our minds, involves our passions. It involves a whole lot of who we are as human beings. That's what desire is. It is a complicated, uh, beautiful mix of things that come out of us that says, I want to bring something into existence. I want to create something. I want to see hap something happen. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Adam and Eve were given desires before the fall. Now we know what happened that caused the fall. 
Eve looks at a fruit and says, ooh, that looks good, right? That looks desirable. And that's where her desires went wrong. But before the fall, she had good desires, good desires. So when you think about your own relationship to your desires, are you kind of suspicious of your desires? Do you repress your desires? Some of us, if we grow up in certain kinds of households, we weren't allowed to really express our desires, to, to have someone actually listen to what we want. That might not have been part of your family dynamic. It might not have been what it was like for you as a child. And so for you, you might have been trained to put your desires away. Mm -mm, no, because there was no one to listen, no one to hear it. But there's Jesus asking this question. What do you want me to do for you? He wants to hear it. He wants to hear it. So that's desire. Now, what hinders us? What hinders desire? What hinders us from even answering that question? What's, what's getting in the way of us being able to truly respond to Jesus with an answer to that question? What do you want me to do for you? Well, let's look at this story a little bit. And we find in, in Bartimaeus um, a lot of things that could have hindered him. Verse 46, they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Now let's think about blindness back in that time of Jesus' life. Blindness in the ancient Near East. Um, was a chronic, is a chronic condition, something that you live with. Um, but, and when you're living with something that's chronic, that's part of your life, then it's part of your story. It becomes part of your life story, right? If you get sick and you get a cold or you get a flu and then you get better, then it doesn't really become part of your life story. But when you have something that's chronic, a pain that's with you for a while, then it does become part of your story. And blindness can be something that you become identified with. And it doesn't have to be just blindness. It can be anything that's chronic that stays with you. It could be trauma, right? It can be abuse. It could be something that you grew up with that stays with you. It's part of your life story. That's what it was for Bartimaeus. Blindness became part of his life story. And being, being someone who is blind, um, he is identifying his want and his desire. And his desire there is that God, Jesus, would make his life better. And by how would he make his life better? Take away the blindness change my life story. My life story right now has got me sitting on the roadside begging. My life story's pain. The pain is keeping me outside of society, outside of community, outside of my family, outside of the temple. It's got me outside. So Jesus, if you heal my blindness, you'll change my story. You'll change my story. You know, when you go see a therapist, and I hope you all do at some point in your life, there's still this unfortunate stigma on therapy. Um, I love therapy. Therapy has helped me quite a bit. But when you sit down with a therapist, the therapist will ask you a similar question that Jesus asks here. When Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? You sit down across from a therapist and the therapist asks, so what brings you here? Or what is your presenting issue? Or, um, yeah, what, what is it that brings you here? Now, for me, and I think for many people who hear that question, you say something, you give an answer. But a therapist kind of does this thing where they ask questions from the left and then from the right and then from over here and behind to try to really see, is that really what brought you here? <laughs> because oftentimes that's not really the issue. It's not really what brought you here. So when, I, when I'm when i sitting down with my therapist, I would come and I would say, well, when I was in my, my 
30s and I was single, I would say, I want to be married, right? I want to be married, but I don't, I don't know. I'm still single. That's what, that's, what's bringing me here. So the therapist asks questions from the left and from the right. And sometimes the therapist will, you know, here's a picture. I want you to look at this painting. What does it make you feel? Okay. All right. We'll, we'll do that. Um, but I have this question. That's what got me here. No, first look at the painting. Or then you get questions about your childhood, or you get questions about your parents. And, and all of these questions are to get at really what is going on. What is it that you want? When, when my therapist did that dance with me, and I think it maybe took a few sessions to get to this question, um, I started telling the story, and I've told you this story before, of when I was eight years old, and there was this 12-year-old girl or so who was really tall, redhead, freckles, but she would, during Sunday school hour, when we were supposed to all go out and play after the Sunday school lesson, she would corral me, this little eight-year-old boy, bring me into a dark room, and that's where she would practice kissing me. And I told that story to my therapist. And as I told that story, I was ready to move on and say, yeah, that happened. And my therapist said, wait, wait, hold on. That should not have happened to you. You were eight years old. You should have had someone protecting you. You were eight years old. You experienced something that no eight-year-old should have to experience. You were harmed. You were eight years old and right there with my tears i realized there's some core issue here there's something that is hindering my desire to be married and at that's at that moment i started to understand some of these hindrances that were playing into my relational life and i i want to just kind of go through some of these that the blind man might have had too one hindrance is shame. A hindrance to desire is shame. If we look at John 9, there's another blind man there. And there the disciples and Jesus are coming across this blind man. And the first question that the disciples ask Jesus is, who sinned? Who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? And sometimes when pain happens to certain people, the narrative starts to shift to, well, whose fault was it? You must have done something wrong. You must have, you or your parents did, right? Something in your childhood, something that your parents did, that's why you're in the mess that you're in. Now, that's not true. But sometimes when we go through something like pain of some sort, we start to adopt this narrative. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe God's punishing me. Maybe there's something in my heart that's not right. And, and so I start to feel ashamed. When I was going through that experience of harm, there were two things that I started to experience. One was there was this pleasure, strange pleasure of being kissed by this girl. But there's also this great feeling of shame because I knew it was wrong. Like I knew I was experiencing something that didn't belong with her. And so shame set in. And with shame, what does shame do? It makes you hide, right? You don't show up. Now, if you want a relationship with someone that's meaningful, you've got to show up. You can't hide. You can't be behind a curtain. But this was the problem that I had. I had experienced something with a woman that made me hide. So here I have this desire to be in a relationship, but at the same time, I've got this hiding thing going on. I'm not showing up with kindness or, or with vulnerability or transparency so someone else can get to know me, right? What about you? Are you afraid to express some sort of desire because you feel like, oh, I'll be exposed? Something in me will be revealed, and I'm not sure... I want other people to know about that. That can hinder your desire. That can hinder your desire. But not Bartimaeus. If you notice Bartimaeus, he's got 
boldness. He knows that Jesus is not going to respond to my shame, whatever that is. He's going to respond to my faith. He's going to respond to my faith. So when he hears it's Jesus of Nazareth, he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's a man who's been ostracized, marginalized, kicked out, can live in the narrative of shame, but he says no, because that's not how the Messiah works. The Messiah is merciful. So I'm going to appeal to him. I'm not going to let shame hinder my desire. I'm going to go. I'm going to want him. That's what he does. And he cries out for mercy. You see how desire overcomes shame. The second hindrance here is fear. So shame can hinder it. Fear can hinder your desire too. Verse 48, many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, right? You can be, a fear, you can be afraid of what people might think if you put a desire out there. Oh, really? You want to start that ministry? Oh, really? You want to you want to risk a relationship? You want to you want to be with her? You want to be with him? What about rejection? Don't you fear rejection? Wow, what if you're going to put yourself out there like that? Ooh. Not this guy. Not this guy. He put himself out there and he said, "I don't care. I don't fear man. I don't fear people. I don't fear what other people think of me right now." I'm going to the Messiah because he's the only one whose opinion matters, right? That's how desire can meet Jesus. And with faith, when desire says, no, 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 no. There's something greater than my shame. There's something greater than my fear. It's Jesus. It's his grace. It's his mercy. So I'm going to him. In my experience of harm, what what I started to also feel was that women weren't safe, right? From that experience, I felt like, uh-oh, if I put myself out there with some woman, then I may get controlled. I may get overwhelmed. And so there's fear that's related with this desire to be in a relationship. This fear was also hindering me as well. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I don't know if I can fully trust somebody like this, but not him. Bartimaeus says, nope, I don't care. I'm not afraid. I'm going to Jesus. That's all that matters. So perhaps you have a desire, but you're afraid. You're afraid to act on it. You're afraid because you are, don't know what other people are going to think, or you're afraid of failure or you're afraid of rejection, whatever that fear might be, that's getting in the way of desire, right? Thirdly, third hindrance is worry. I love this little scene, verse 49. It says he's calling out, he's calling out, and Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Love that. When we get Mark, in, in Mark, Jesus is very much moving. He's always moving. Mark is like this really fast acting kind of book because Jesus is on his way to give his life as a ransom for many. He's the king who's going to go to Jerusalem, go to the cross. That's what he's got his mind on. But when he hears Bartimaeus call out his desire for Jesus to come and show mercy on him, he stopped. Jesus stopped. When you express your desire to Jesus, he stops. He pays attention because he wants to know what you want him to do. And then Jesus says, call him. So they call to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And then notice this, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, if you're blind and you've got a cloak, and you throw it aside, and this whole thing about Jesus healing your sight doesn't really work out, you may not find that cloak again, right? That cloak may be gone. That cloak was keeping you warm. That cloak is out there in the keeping you from all the elements. Shouldn't you be more concerned about your belongings, more concerned about the things that keep you secure in your life? 
Shouldn't you worry about your clothing, your cloak? He throws the cloak aside to express his desire to Jesus, meaning I'm not going to worry about what I'm wearing. I'm not going to worry about my security. I'm not going to worry about provision because when I express my desire to the king, he's going to take care of me. You see that? When you express your desire to Jesus, you can count on the fact that he will take care of you. I love when Jesus says, oh, you're so worried. Consider the lilies of the field. Remember? Look at the flowers. Now, if you just stop there, you know, anytime you see lilies or flowers, you have to stop first and say, oh, they're beautiful, aren't they? Right? Oh, how lovely they are. And I think that's intentional. Jesus wants you to see the beauty of the lilies. But then the next point is you never see flowers go to the mall and buy clothes. You never see flowers who are worried about what they're going to wear. Because flowers know the Heavenly Father is going to clothe them, right? If flowers know that, and look how beautiful they are, then are you not much more valuable than these? Will not the Father clothe you? Will not the Father provide for you? Here's the thing. When you bring your wants and desires to God, your desires are for something beautiful. Your desires are to make something good come into existence. That's what good desire does. Good desire is to bring something good into the planet, into the atmosphere, something good, because that's what God did. That's what God does when he creates, when he wants something. He's always bringing good. And so when you bring your desire to Jesus What gets associated with that that is two things. One, he's going to take care of you. Two, he's going to make something beautiful. He's going to do something beautiful. Out of the worst pain, he'll make something beautiful. All right? So worry can hinder desire. If you are allowing the cares of this world, what's going to happen? How am I going to pay bills? All of those kinds of things. But you sense that God has given you this desire to do something good. Then consider the lilies of the field, right? Don't worry about your life. If God's given you that desire, don't worry about your life. Bring your desire to Jesus. Watch him provide and watch him do some beautiful work when you bring your wants to him. So ask yourself, What's hindering your desire? Is it shame? Don't want to expose yourself by saying, this is what I want. Is it fear? Are you afraid about what other people might think? Is it worry? Are you anxious about your own security when you express this desire? What is it? What is it? Once you get over that, you get to the stages of desire. So the stages of desire, there's two. The first desire that this blind man, Bartimaeus, brings is really, one, a desire for a better life. I just want a better life. 51, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asks him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Rabbi, I want to see. I want you to help my life be better. And usually when when we first bring our desire to God, it's usually about that. God, I want you to make my life better. I want you to heal my, my loved one of cancer. I want you to fix my marriage. I want you to help my company. It's really tanking right now. I want you to to do something to change the relationship I have with a friend who's betrayed me. I, I want you to fix this. I want you to make my life better. And that's usually how we start with our desires. It starts with those things that make our life better. And that's what he does. Jesus stops, heals him. But the second stage of desire takes us to another level. When you get to making your life better, and then you see Jesus showing up in your life, something happens to your desire. 
you realize something about your desire, that your desire at its core is not just about fixing your marriage. It's not just about your company doing better than it is. The deepest desire that you have is for God. That's the deepest desire of your heart. And that's the second stage. See, we bring to Jesus the desires for a better life. And then Jesus shows up and you start to realize, oh, there's something even better. There's something even better than what I was bringing to him. And that's God himself. When you get to this place in your in your own walk with God, where you are desiring God himself more than what he does to bless your life. Now you're walking in Christian maturity. When you say, God, you're what I want. You're the ultimate satisfaction of my life. Then you're entering into the life of the psalmist. Remember Psalm 1611? In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God, you're the one that I want. I thought I wanted just healing from this sickness. I thought I wanted a a relationship that would be mended. But actually, all of that are just desires that awaken this greater desire for you. For you. Isaiah 26, 8, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth, we wait eagerly for you, for your name and renown are the desire of our souls. It's you, it's your name, it's your renown. That's what I want. That's what I want. So it's good when Jesus says, what is it that you want me to do for you? He's bringing you down this road That says, I'll help you with your life. I'll make things better for you in some way. But his that's not the ultimate end. The ultimate end is to bring you to a place where you realize that he's your ultimate desire. When you get to this place, like the psalmist did in Psalm 63, where he says, My God, oh, let's turn there. Psalm 63. But here's where the psalmist, and we get this inside track on what does it look like when somebody just wants God, just wants God. Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. See how personal that is? See how personally intimate that is? That's not God, you are God. It is you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. You get that? Because your love is better than life. We come to Jesus and say, God, I need you to help me with my life, right? But then when we meet with him, we start understanding, oh, wait, I thought it was my life that was the issue. It's actually your love that's the issue. Your love is better than life. That's when you get it. That's when you get it. You get to this place where you go, oh, God, it's you that I've wanted. You're the one I've been longing for in a dry and weary land where there's no water, you're the only one, you. This is what Jesus did with the Samaritan woman, remember at the well, John 4, says, I have living water, living water for you. I want to give it to you. But that, That woman was so caught up in her shame that she couldn't access that deep desire. And so what did she do? She deflected, right? She was just, uh, um, Okay, living water, all right, okay. You know, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She starts getting religious, right? Thinking, oh, yeah, religion is what will get me something with God. And Jesus says, ah, it's not about the mountains, not about location. The Father is seeking those who will just worship him in spirit and in truth, who will love him, who will desire him in spirit and in truth. 
Uh, and then he says, I want to tell you more about this, but go get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You have had five. And so what, is, what does he do? He's digging into her deepest desires. You have longed to be loved, and your longings for love have led you to all the wrong places. I'm here to tell you that there is satisfaction. He doesn't come to, to her and say, hey, your desire, hmm, you shouldn't have desire. That desire is wrong. Desire is bad. He says, no, you've been desiring, but your desires have been, like C.S. Lewis would say, too small, too little. Your desires are too little. They're not big enough. Go call your husband. I've had no husband. You're right. You've had five. Oh, I can see that you're a prophet, right? Digging, digging, digging to the point where he says, the one you seek, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. I'm the one with the living water. I'm the one who will fulfill you. I'm the one who will quench this thirst in your heart. That's how God comes to us. But the beautiful thing here is that sometimes it's not about us trying to find God with our wants and our desires. It's Jesus who's coming to us. Just like Jesus came to Bartimaeus and said, call him, call him, call him. He finds him. He finds us. He found that woman at the well, and he finds us. And he says the same thing. I will quench your thirst. I am the living water that you've been looking for, because my love is better than your life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? couple things about this desire, though. We know it can go wrong. When we find out that God is the ultimate answer and solution to our, our quest for um, thirst to be quenched, when we find out it's God's, then we move towards God, but there's all kinds of exits, all kinds of ways we can go off the path, right? And we know that. We know that our desires can go wrong. We, we know that we've been made for love, but sometimes we look for love in all the wrong places. Or, or we try to find pleasure, and we know God is the ultimate source of that pleasure, but then there's pleasures over here, pleasures over here, pleasures over here. And so we have all these different things that can get us off track. So that leads us to the last point. We need our desires to be trained. We need to train our desires. And there's two Two important things that train our desires. One is the role of community. The role of community. Do you notice this crowd in this scene? On the first hand, they are hindering Bartimaeus. Hey, don't bother Jesus. Pipe down. Keep your voice down. Stop making a ruckus. The Messiah doesn't have time for someone like you. You're over here. He didn't come for you. And then when they find out, oh, Jesus did come for him, they say, hey, cheer up. He's come for you. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Go to Jesus, right? You've got these desires. He wants to know about them. Go. That's what good community does. When good community is around you and hears your desires, they, they say, hey, those are good desires. Bring them. Let's pray those together. So you want to share those desires with others so that they can direct with you, those desires towards God, right? Sometimes there's desires that you had, like you want to see a family member come to know Jesus, and you've been asking and asking and asking. And sometimes it's getting so hard to ask that you just don't have the words anymore to ask. But you share that with your community. You share that with others, and they start to pray the prayers that you can't pray anymore. They bring those desires to God. I love that in our Tuesday prayer group that we, we've done that. We've done that. It's like, oh, we've been praying so long and so hard and, I, and you're weary of it. And, and, you know, some of us, we get tired of sharing the same thing again and again and again. But there, that's why we're there. We're there to say, hey, you're tired of it. 
but we'll take it. We'll take those desires and bring it to Jesus. And that's where community can be really helpful. But community can also be very helpful in saying, hey, I don't know if really wanting those kinds of things in your life is really God's will either. So community can really train our desires where you're saying, why do you feel like you need all those likes on social media? Is that fueling your, your desire for something that only God can fill, right? That's what community does. Community asks you those questions. So you say, oh, yeah, I, I really do want to find my joy in God, but I've been finding my joy over here. And community says, oh, here, here, just redirect it. Go back to God, right? That's what community does. We can't be those who hinder. Don't be like the crowd in the first point. point. Don't hinder. I've been thinking about, like Trisha, just thinking about what is her desire. If she comes to me and says, I have this desire, and it might require me to change my life and my, my responsibilities and my duties, well, am I willing? Am I willing to change so that she can actually see her desires fulfilled? Community is willing to do that. Community is willing to sacrifice so that others can see their desires fulfilled. There's also some things that community does that might hinder desire in a good way. Like there might be, you know, if you're married to somebody who then all of a sudden becomes really ill, right? But you've had these desires, you know, I've had these desires, you know, for a career or whatever it is, but your spouse is needing your help. Well, that's a, that's a time in which your desires need to shift towards caring for your spouse, right? That's a good shift. That's a good hindering of desires. So now my desires are shifting in the right way so that I can help and support my spouse, right? So community has a big role in desire. The second thing that trains our desires is scripture. Scripture, right? When we finally ultimately know God is my ultimate joy and my ultimate pleasure, he's the one that I want. Oh, that's great. But now there's this grid that falls upon us now where we go, wait, my desires are getting a little tangled up. Uh, I want God, but I also want this, (laughs) right? I want God and I want that. And scripture helps us understand and sort out what is it that I should really want in my life and then orders our loves accordingly. The scripture tells us, here's the order of the things you should want in your life. And that's what scripture is really great for. Because if we don't have scripture to train us in our desires, then our desires can totally overtake our judgment. You know, it's kind of like when you're, we haven't done this for a while, but we, when you drive down to LA and you take I-5, right? And you get to that place where it's almost lunchtime, but you're not sure. But on I-5, there's Kettleman City. Remember Kettleman City? That's where the in and out is, right? Among, among seven other fast food restaurants, right? There's, there's all these restaurants at Kettleman City, but you're like trying to figure out, I'm not sure if I'm hungry right now. If I take the exit, mm, yeah, but maybe we'll just keep going. Right. And so you think, oh, yeah, we'll keep going. Well, turns out there's not a really decent restaurant for another hour or two. Right. And so when you're like hour two on I 5 and now you're hungry. Right. And when you're that hungry, you will settle for anything at that point. Right. Your discrimination of fine dining has all of a sudden gone way, way, way down. Because why? You're just hungry. Right. You're losing your discrimination. You're losing your judgment because all that matters is I want to eat. Well, the same thing happens when we are just letting our desires just run. When we let our desires run, and it can overtake our judgment, overtake our wisdom to the point that we lose discernment and we, we settle for lesser things and we might settle for things that can end up destroying us right? So that's why we need scripture. We need scripture and we need community to train our desires so that we have wisdom in discerning what is it that God wants for me. This is what God has 
laid out as what to do with our desires. He doesn't say repress them. He doesn't say put them away. He actually says, tell me what you want me to do for you. So how do you answer that? How do you answer this question? Jesus is here asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Don't let anything hinder it. What's getting in the way? Ask Jesus to help you ask him, here's what I'd like you to do. Help me overcome these obstacles that are inside of me. Jesus, help me to say it. Help me to express what I want. And then what stage are you at in your desires? Are all of your desires and all your prayers just about you and blessing your life and blessing your kids and helping you with your homework and all those things, which are fine, but are you? do you need to move up to the next stage of desire where you can say, God, I have received so much from you. I think I need to make you my ultimate desire. Is that where you need to be? What stage of desire are you at today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we find ourselves like Bartimaeus. You've come across our path. And we know, we know that you are the ultimate answer to our lives. And so we cry out to you. We cry out to you. And then you say, yeah, tell me, what is it that you want me to do for you? Uh, like the Samaritan woman, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that you are actually the ultimate desire that we have. Like you said to her, if you just knew the gift of God, if you just knew who it is that's asking you for a drink, then I would have given you living water. Lord, so much of our, of our asking has to do with things that really won't ultimately satisfy, but you have living water. You are the one who quenches our thirst. So Lord, we're hungry for you. We're hungry for you. You're the one we want. So this is our desire, Lord. Ultimately, it's you. So Lord, satisfy our desire. You said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So Lord, help us not be afraid. Help us not to let anything hinder us from just expressing what we want, our ultimate desires, God, for a better life, yes, but ultimately for you. We pray in Jesus, your great name. Amen. Amen.